to their futures. Soldiers speak out. Welcome to Veterans Hour. I'm your host, Zahid Chowdhury. Today in the studio, we have Mark Fleming, a Vietnam veteran and, and uh, a member of Veterans for Peace. And we have Larry Mascueda, a uh, professor of political economy and a great researcher on, uh, on, on effects and, and, and political da dynamics of war. So here we are, and uh, today's program's topic is Vietnam Full Disclosure. You might ask yourself, Vietnam Full Disclosure? What does that mean? Full Disclosure? Vietnam Full Disclosure? So I'll start with you, Mark Fleming. What is Vietnam Full Disclosure? What does that mean? Well, Vietnam Full Disclosure is a parallel effort to what is the billed as the 50th uh, commemor commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War. The uh, Pentagon is, uh, in fact, the United States government is marking the anniversary of the Vietnam War over between 2012 and 2025. And as part of that uh, effort, they're putting out, shall we say, a rather one-sided version of the war. And as a, as a result, v Veterans for Peace nationally has decided that we will also put out a version of the war because they, we think it's distorted. It essentially buries the history, of, of much of the history of Vietnam, uh, the history of the, uh, the atrocities, of what we did to the land, the, the po poisoning of the land, uh, what we did to the Vietnamese people and are still doing to the Vietnamese people. So all that is part of the story that's not being told. So Veterans for Peace has said, as long as, you know, during this commemoration, we will make sure that we tell our side of the story. And what we're, Larry and I are doing is uh, organizing a teach-in at the Evergreen State College on Octo October 28th to bring that message uh, to Olympia. And con we'll continue that with other chapters uh, working in the region to make sure that people don't forget that you know, these things did happen. You know, you heard, you've heard the story that it was a noble cause. Well, along with all that nobility came some really ugly things. And it also affected America very adversely. So we want that story to get out because as long as people believe the sanitized version of a war, they're going to think that you can go to war. And in fact, go ahead. What what good came out of the war? What good? I got out alive. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. But that's as, about as being it. As a Vietnam veteran. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, as far as the good, I can't really think of any. But one of the things, it's interesting. One of the things that they're talking about is, let's see. To highlight the advances in technology, science, medicine, and related to military research conducted during the Vietnam War. So those are the good things that came out. And I know that they, they did uh, improve medevac procedures, which they're using in the U.S. now. But we also researched uh, all kinds of defoliants and chemicals, uh, different ways to kill people, cluster bombs. I mean, there were any number of th This technology was not always benign. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the story. So what was it, 18? million gallons of Agent Orange? Something like that. It was an uh, immense amount. I mean, I mean you know, um, over a million plus children which are born with birth defects because of the chemical experiments we carried out on such a huge scale. I mean, is that is that banality of evil or is that it's, is that we should look at the benefits of the evil or... or, or I'm not entirely sure. I mean, that's that's we think as, as Veterans for Peace that this particular this, the objectives of this commemoration do not go far enough. In fact, it almost seems like they're trying to eliminate some of the aspects, such as the anti-war movement. And that one of the other objectives is to uh, recognize, this, uh, highlight this, uh, pay tribute to the contributions made on the home front by the people of the United States during the Vietnam War. Well, if you look at their timeline, there's nothing about the anti-war. There's nothing about the moratoriums. There's nothing about Kent State. There's nothing about the Vietnam veterans against the war. I mean, you know, we, the first time in American history, soldiers as a, in a large body, as a large group, opposed the war they fought. And that's the very dramatic photos of veterans throwing their medals back to the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, at Congress in 1971. So, thank you. So here we have in the studio today um, a Vietnam veteran and intellectual and uh, non-sugar-coated version mm -hmm. of how the history was, as uh, late uh, Howard Zinn would like to say. So, Larry, tell us, who were, who, when did it actually start? Well, the Vietnam War, this is the 50th anniversary, presumably the Pentagon is saying, and they're saying 2012 when the 50th anniversary started. 
but actually the United States started to attack Vietnam in 1946. During, the, during World War II, the United States actually worked with Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh in Vietnam because they were fighting against the Japanese. So we were allies with the Ho Chi Minh and the, and the communists in, inside of Vietnam, just like we were allies with the Soviet Union. After World War II in 1946, the United States actually turned his back on Ho Chi Minh because he expected the United States to support him because that's what he was told. He actually wrote letters to, Howard Zinn talks about this in his book. Uh, Ho Chi Minh actually wrote eight letters to Truman to the United States to actually to try to get the United States to help uh, the Vietnamese people because he assumed that the United States would help the people of Vietnam. Actually, Ho Chi Minh first contacted Woodrow Wilson, of all people, in Paris because when he was a young man because he wanted to get rid of the French uh, co colonization. So you can have various dates. 1946, the United States turned its back on Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese people. 1954, and the United States is actually supporting the French and bombing the people of Vietnam. In 1956, there was supposed to be an election in Vietnam the United States signed on to, but the United States knew that Ho Chi Minh would win the election, so Eisenhower did not allow the election. In 1959, actually, it was the first American death officially in, Viet in Vietnam. And in 1964 is, of course, the Gulf of Tonkin incident that we were lied to. And I think that lying is an important word because it's not just a question of um, uh, we have a different perspective of what the American government was doing. The American people were lied to continually for many, many years during the entire time of the Vietnam War. And a lie is actually, the definition of a lie is a misrepresentation of fact. So it's not just a question of opinion, it's not just a question of different perspective, but it's a misrepresentation of fact. Uh, uh, Daniel Ellsberg points out in the movie Hearts and Minds, he said this in his, in his uh, book and other information, is that the American people were lied to by Truman, by Eisenhower, by uh, Kennedy, by Johnson and by, by Nixon. And so more than five administrations. Yeah, five yes. administrations. And then, of course, President Ford, at the time, was making that particular statement. But it's, the United States actually, the, he, he points out, Ellsberg points out, it's a tribute to the American people that we, our government perceived that they had to lie to us. But it's not a tribute that we're so easily uh, misled. And so we need to find out what actually happened during the Vietnam War, not because we want to go back and say, I told you so, but because we want to stop the future wars from happening. Because if you lie to the young people today, because 50 years ago, obviously most people were not even alive 50 years ago. Most people are younger than, than 50, uh, 50 years old in, in American society. So they don't really know what happened during the Vietnam War unless they studied it. And most people don't study it. So we need to find out what actually occurred so we're not lied to about, continually lied to about Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places. So we're not continually lied to about what's going to might happen in Iran. So we're not continually lied to about what might happen in Morocco or some other place in the future. So we need to find out what happened 50 years ago so we can find out what happened 20 years ago with Iraq and so we can find out what's happening today. So that's actually one of the reasons for having this teaching. So we the real people, we the 99%, we the non-war profiteers mm -hmm. whose blood and whose combined wealth, intellectual wealth, body wealth, energies are used to make weapons of, uh, to, make, to make instruments of death and destruction. You know, perhaps, you know, what can we learn from the lies of the past? How would that? Well, we can learn to, to try to figure out why the lies don't make sense. We can try to learn uh, who's actually benefiting from the wars and who's not benefiting from the wars. What, you asked the question, what did we get out of the Vietnam War? Mm -hmm. Well, the American people got nothing out of the Vietnam War, but the American elites actually learned quite a, earned quite a bit of money from the Vietnam War. And so, What's the purpose of the, what's the purposes of the war? What's the purposes of American foreign policy in general? And the Vietnam War in American society lasted at least from 1954 to 1975. That's about over, almost 20 years, over 20 years. And so we need to find out the, the current war in Iraq is obviously lasting from 1991 in this current phase, one phase, second phase, and now the, now the third phase. So we need to figure out how we can dissect what the lies are. And that's why we want to have a teaching, so we can actually tell people what was going on. It's not just to say, I told you so, yeah. but to try to figure out uh, what are the lessons we can learn from the past for us for the future. So that perhaps people can see the patterns? Yeah, so you can recognize the distortions. And it's not, and, you know, they don't come out and lie so directly so much as they distort it. I mean, the best mm -hmm. example of that recently was Dick Cheney in the Iraq War. Uh, they can take pieces of information that sound credible. And if you look back at the history of Vietnam, that's exactly what they did. People supported that. Up until they started saying, well, this doesn't fit. Uh, it came, came early with some people, 
But for many of us, uh, myself included, the Tet Offensive was just a wake-up call because suddenly every, you know, we were winning, we were winning, everything was going fine, and then, and then suddenly it all came apart. And, and suppo you know, supposedly we won the, the Tet Offensive because they stopped it. But in effect, we demonstrated that there wasn't really no, there was no way we were going to practically destroy this opposition. You know, we heard many uh, politicians say, we should bomb them back to the Stone Age. But if you studied uh, Vietnamese history, you know, they would just take the rubble and start fighting us with that. I mean, it, they are very determined. Is, is that what we should learn from the French uh, many attempts to colonize them? So uh, you're trying to perhaps, if, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm trying to understand you saying that Vietnamese people and people in general do not like to, uh, to be colonized or occupied or... or I think that's is, is, very is, is, correct. It, is it intrinsic to human spirit, perhaps? I think so. I mean, to have someone coming in from the outside saying, you must do things this way, as opposed to the way you've done it. Now, if you have somebody come in from the outside and say, we want to help you, well, sometimes there are motives behind that. Mm -hmm. But by and large, when you're looking at uh, world, world powers, they're not mm -hmm. there to help. They're there for their own interests, mm -hmm. even if they don't entirely understand their own interests. Mm -hmm. You know, we always said we were going over there fighting communism, and in fact, what we did was essentially uh, squander almost a generation of young Americans, a lot of money, and we're still killing Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. So, from this official commemoration, what is the Department of War, or sorry, the new name is Department of Defense. It's very Orwellian. Yeah. Um, we should remember what the name was once upon a time, perhaps in the McNamara days. Yeah, in fact, the Department of Defense was invented in 1947. Okay. The first administration of George Washington from 1789 to 1947, we had a Department of War. Okay. In 1947, the United States government changes that Department of Defense. Okay. And, and there's, there's a real logic to that because if you tell people we have to spend uh, six or seven hundred billion dollars on defense, say, well, maybe because somebody's out to get us. If you tell people we're going to spend six or seven hundred million dollars of the current budget on war, people might say, what war are you talking about? Why do we have to have this particular war? Oh. And so it's a way to actually sort of get into people's uh, minds mm -hmm. because we're, most of what we do in the United States is not really defense. Mm -hmm. It's actually sort of a, uh, protecting the empire. And, actually, and that's not a word that uh, mm -hmm. uh, just used by the left. Mm -hmm. Karl Rove, mm -hmm. uh, Bush's brain, mm -hmm. basically talks about we are an empire. The Project for a New what, American Century. Yeah, why so, do we have to have empire? Well, we don't have to have empire, but we are an empire, uh -huh. <laughs> both in our land mass mm -hmm. of 50 states in the United States mm -hmm. and also our, the so-called interests of the United States overseas. Mm -hmm. So we have this empire the United States is trying to protect. So you talked about Carl. Why well, are you talking mm -hmm. personally? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I've heard but him say that. No, you're, yeah, talk, yeah. you're talking about that. Yeah. He, he said it his, in his yeah, own he did. words that yeah, we his are. his own word, that we are, we are an empire, mm -hmm. which is true. The United States is the empire of the 20th century, especially after World War II. The British were the empire of the 19th century. The Spanish were the empire before that. The Holy Roman Empire, the Roman Empire. So right now, the United States is the dominant empire. Many people are talking about China as actually might be the dominant nation of the 21st century. Now, one of the ways that actually might be beneficial for the United States people is that if, the, if China is going to become a, an empire, one of the ways that we can actually stop empire is to, as the empire, stop the concept of empire. You know, what's, if, if we actually have the American people say, so we're going to be... Uh, not benevolent, but we're going to have a, try to have a more just world, and other people will get in, get in on that too. Because the, the people of the empire, the, more, the 99 percent mm -hmm. of the empire, usually does not benefit. It's usually the top one or two percent. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about the top one percent, but it's a very small number of people mm -hmm. benefit from empire. And that's actually the purpose of the, the Vietnam War, is to, to tell the world back in 1940s and 1950s that the United States is not going to give up on any portion of the, of the planet. Because the Vietnam actually was not really the main target. Richard Nixon talks about this himself in his article that he wrote in Foreign, foreign, uh, foreign Affairs, which is the, uh, uh, the, uh, see the pr project, not the project in the American Century, but the Council of Foreign Relations uh, ma manual. So the main target was Indonesia. We need to protect the, our interest in Indonesia. Vietnam was an afterthought. But the United States kept sort of going in and going in and going in, and then it ended up uh, losing the war in Vietnam which actually hurt the, hurt the empire. So what kind of interest did the United States have or could possibly have in Indonesia? Well, one of the things like you were Mark, talking about is that we were trying to, the United States was, I don't want to use the word we, the United States was trying yeah. to stop what they perceived as communism around the world. 
And there were people who were members of the Communist Party, but there are also people who are just uh, regular people who are trying to make a living, and the United States defined them as communists. In fact, uh, Noam Chomsky in his, in various, does quite a bit of research. And one of the things he found out that the, the official State Department's conception of communists in 1949, the definition of a communist is, quote, one who believes that the government has a direct responsibility for the welfare of his own people. That's wow. It. One who believes the government has a direct responsibility for the welfare of his own people. So that's how the American government considered uh, Arbenz in Guatemala to be a communist. That's why the American government considers many people around the world to be a communist, because they're not really members of the Communist Party, but they actually believe that Guatemala and other countries should actually be used for Guatemalan people. And the, and the purpose of the danger of communism, according to the 1955 State Department document, the declass, declassified document, is that if I remember the exact word, the communist, quote, refused to allow their economies to complement the industrial economies of the West. They refused mm -hmm. to allow their economies to complement the industrial economies of the West. So the problem for uh, the United States had with Vietnam and China and other mm -hmm. places around the world in the 50s was that the United States couldn't go in the way it wants to go in. Mm -hmm. And so it, it wasn't allowing the empire to actually have total dominance in, in the area. I see. Thank I you. Think to follow up on the idea of empire, an empire doesn't necessarily listen. An empire has its own interests, its own ideas, and whatever the people in that area expect is secondary. And the idea, you think also about the idea that uh, we must be an empire, listen to people in Congress now saying, we must be there, we must be there, we've got to do that. I mean, they're, they're drumming for war now. And all that is part of this idea that somehow America must, you know, we rose to become an empire, dominant superpower in the world, and we must be that way forever. How many countries are we at war right now? Anybody has a tally? Anybody has a clue? Um, I mean, actually, there's well, there's a recent movie that came out with uh, Jeremy Scahill called uh -huh. uh, Dirty Wars, uh -huh. and he talks about in the movie. And this movie is about four years old now. Mm -hmm. Is that we are currently? I think the figure you use that we're actually either bombing or involved with uh, covert activities in about 60 or 70 countries. Mm -hmm. You know, Yemen, Iraq, Iran, mm -hmm. all kinds of different places around the around the world. So it's not always an official war, but it's actually war-like activities. Yeah. I mean, we have soldiers in the Philippines now, I believe. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. For fighting and dying. Yeah. yeah. Is, is it sustainable? No. Actually, one of the things about empire, if you think about empire, the concept, the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. the Holy Roman Empire, mm -hmm. the Spanish Empire, mm -hmm. the British Empire, mm -hmm. is that they're all gone as empires. Mm -hmm. The United States is the current dominant empire. Mm -hmm. So we only have two options if we're the mm -hmm. dominant empire. Either stay the empire, mm -hmm or start to collapse as an empire. Mm -hmm. And history tells us that empires eventually collapse. Mm -hmm. And so it's not beneficial for the American people to try to maintain ourselves as an empire. Mm -hmm. and so, it's, so the American people, I think, need to uh, think about what's the purpose of American foreign policy and how does it actually affect the American people. Oh. For example, like, you know, in the, uh, veterans take a, mm -hmm. well, people in the, active, in the military service take a oath to protect the Constitution against all enemies foreign and domestic. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out who are the domestic enemies of the American people. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, it's, it's often not people who are, you know, that we are told to be afraid of, mm -hmm. but it's often people in the top echelon. Obviously, George Bush is an enemy mm -hmm. of, the, of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, Karl Rove is an enemy of the Constitution. Some people think, for example, foreign policy especially, mm -hmm. that Obama is an enemy of the Constitution in regards to his drone attacks and other types of activity. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about go beyond the, the box, the normal box, and think about what is it going to be like for our children and our, and our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. well, my, my grandchild is two and a half years old, mm -hmm. so I'm assuming that he's going to live to the end of the century. Mm -hmm. So he might probably be uh, 88 years old mm -hmm. or 90 years old in the year 2100. Mm -hmm. And so what's the world going to be like for him? Mm -hmm. What's the world going to be like for the children and the grandchildren that, that currently exist? Mm -hmm. So we are very much connected to the 22nd century, so we need to get started to uh, educate people and also get active in what we need to do to uh, make this country actually a democracy. And one of the things that would help along those lines is look is under, knowing and understanding history. And with Vietnam, you know, we do have a lot of history. Hmm. Um, there's an immense amount of literature, research on it, talking about it, you, so much more than you can actually synthesize. I was going to point out one uh, book that I've been using. Uh, it's mm -hmm. called American Reckoning by Christian Appy. You know, follows it through, and one of the, one of the points and 
that he makes is that after the right after the war, or after, after you know, 1975, after the fall of Vietnam, and for s some years thereafter, Americans had no interest whatsoever in foreign adventures. At least we still had all kinds of soldiers everywhere, but you know they didn't want to have soldiers fighting and dying anywhere. You know, uh, I think George Bush the first described it as the Vietnam syndrome, and essentially the. The militarists did not like that. They set out to reverse that, and beginning with Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. he came back and said, called it the noble cause. Noble cause no, of bloodshed, a, a paradigm of death said, and destruction a noble cause. is somehow noble? Yeah. Because how, we could, were, how could wonderful, amazing American folks buy this Orwellian and, twist? And part of that is, well, it was no, it was, it's noble because our, our servicemen and, and women went over there and served honorably. Forget about the purposes of the war. You know, there was a lot. I mean, there was a lot of sacrifice and courage in Vietnam. I d mm -hmm. don't dispute that. Mm -hmm. But when I look at it, look at my own service, and I, okay, what did it accomplish? That's what I say. I got out alive. That's about it. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I, nobody that I knew served with had any sense that we were doing any great mm -hmm. national service. We were basically trying to get out there alive. So, mm -hmm. get your three hundred sixty-five days. Don't. Make a mistake to get yourself or anyone else killed, and then you go home. It doesn't quite work that way because it comes with you. But mm -hmm. we didn't know that at the time. But so that's what, uh, right. you're talking about history of opposition to war. Just tell us, give us a sense. You said something that people, American people, didn't want to be part of the war. The troops, you know, d didn't want to be part of the war. I mean, how could the war go on against the wills of the people? It's uh, just kind of the institutional imperative. The once the war got started, well, you can't. One of the one of the stories you always hear is, well, we can't dishonor the sacrifice of our soldiers. You know, if they you know they've gone over there and died, we can't just pull out. So in other words, we just have to keep sending more soldiers over there to die. So it's kind of it just builds on itself. There's a famous uh, example in Iraq War, mm -hmm. yeah, where a Marine was killed. His parents had been opposed to the war originally, but after he was killed, his mother uh, basically turned around and said, well, my son sacrificed, so I can't, I have to honor his memory. His father became a, a very dedicated anti-war activist. So thinking about why we're there and what we can do with it. And most people, I think, didn't really think about it. I mean, you know, obviously college, I mean, the war was going on. My most, biggest thought was, well, how do I, can I just stay in college until it's over? Uh, and then as I started reading, you know, learning more and understanding the history uh, of Vietnam and American foreign policy, I started realizing this is really an oppressive regime. Mm -hmm. It did, wasn't strong enough for me to stay out of which, the war. Which, which regime you're talking about? I'm talking about, about the American mi militarism. Mm -hmm. That we are there for no good reason, and if you look at the history, the Vietnamese history, they're not going to stop. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the great awarenesses I had in Vietnam was when we were on a mission somewhere in the jungle and we started finding food caches. And I'm thinking, okay, we are here fighting people who hide their food under rocks in the woods, and we haven't been able to defeat them in six years. So what does that tell us? You know, they were determined, mm -hmm. and, we, and we were there. And during the year that I was in Vietnam, I mean, GI resistance was strong. I mean, that, that was the year we had, we had units that would not go out. We had fragging. Women wouldn't go out. They wouldn't go out on patrol. Okay. Uh, there were some. So th there was a resistance within the troops. Yes. And they refused to. I mean, tell me about what is what is that called? Is that mutiny? What is a deserter? Or for the audience, for the the civilian people, because right now in this time in our history, there are lesser and lesser people serving mm -hmm. in the military, and they do not understand this military jargon. Yeah. So can well, you deserter, deserter, deserter is someone who leaves the army without permission. I think okay. you're AWOL for a period of time, and then mm -hmm. they just drop you from the rules of the deserter and turn you over to the FBI. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a mutiny is where you, where a group of soldiers refuse an order. Mm -hmm. so, so to I, me, that's that's they they're not going out on patrol. patrol. Yeah. I recall, mm -hmm. yeah, like uh, in the first cavalry, we I recall one battalion or one company, one of the battalions refused to go out. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're including their officers, mm -hmm. they, and they replaced the officers, and somehow they, I think they all ended up going out again. But there was that, it was that kind of uh, situation. There's a famous uh, essay or an article written in 1971 by an army, um, an an analyst saying, this army is broken. This army has been, is on the verge of non-functioning. 1971. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Officers won't 
you know, are afraid of their sol soldiers. G uh, soldiers uh, ignore their officers, and mm -hmm. and we did that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we would uh, we we didn't mutiny. We just uh, we would just not look for the enemy. So my question is, what is fragging? For fragging. our audience, which would like to know, uh, we heard that word. I mean, people understand different meaning. What do you really mean? Uh, it's a form of assassination. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you kill so someone. You mean friendly fire. Well, actually, it was fragging. It's called you take a grenade and mm -hmm. roll it under some bunk of somebody you didn't like, and it would mm -hmm. go off. And it's a fra it's a fragmentation grenade, and that would kill them. There's a, also it been played on the American national TV and the unit and several other movies in the past you know decade or so that uh, what was the average lifespan of a brand new second lieutenant in Vietnam in the field? I mean there are yeah. three four different caveats and some figures which they have you know it was short. I mean it also also depends on what period of the war. Yes, like, I don't think any of our lieutenants were killed, mm. but also in in my year. The Army had so many officers that needed to combat experience, we, re we changed lieutenants maybe every four months. Whoa. Uh, I had six company commanders. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't even the sense of uh, bonding in mm -hmm. the units. I mean, we as, as Working the, together as a team or something like yeah, that? Yeah, what we, where we worked together as a team was trying to figure out how we can get out of this. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we do the least and not get court-martialed? So, so what you're trying to say, correct me if I'm wrong, So. Soldiers didn't want to fight. The Vietnamese didn't want to be colonized. They already did that, you know, against mm. the French. And then American people did not want it that. And still, it lasted that long. Yeah. So it shows, to me, it shows um, a real control on the media or, or, or perhaps some other uh, programming. It was that. Okay. To control people. Especially the education system. I, I, I've taught in college for about 40 years now. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I think everybody should get an education. Mm -hmm. But in this particular case, if you take a look at the studies from, the polls from 1961, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 1963 to 1971, mm -hmm. the, the uh, polls of people supporting the war or being against the war. The people who supported the war the most were the college graduates. We have this illusion that somehow college students and the people who are college graduates opposed the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. That's not true in the beginning. It was actually the high school dropouts and the high school graduates who opposed the war the most in the beginning from 1963 to, 19, to 1968. In 1968, the average college graduate started to oppose the war also because we were losing the war. So the more you go to school, the more you're socialized. I mean, one of the purposes of education is obviously to help people get jobs. But another very important purpose of education is to socialize people within the society that they belong to. So the more you went to school, the more you actually supported the war from till, till 1968. My own personal experience is that when I went to Iowa State University from 1967 to 1971. And 67 to 69, I was in ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps. Mm -hmm. I was going to be an Army officer. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be a good, good officer. So I studied the war on my own. We never actually studied the war in the ROTC classes, mm -hmm. but I studied the war on my own mm -hmm. and also talked to a lot of veterans who were coming back. Mm -hmm. And the more I studied the war, the more I figured this war is wrong. Mm -hmm. This war is wrong from the American perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go. And that's when I became an anti-war activist, anti-imperialist anti activist also. Mm -hmm. And so from 1969 to, to the present time, I'm, I'm trying to work for peace and justice issues. Now, it's very important that the American people understand that the Vietnam War was never, as I mentioned before, never particularly important for the American government. One of the questions I asked my students is that the day we lost the war, for example, when Saigon fell, or when Saigon was liberated, depending on how you wanted to find it, in, in April 29, 1975, mm -hmm. what happened to the United States when the United States lost the war? I mean, when Germany lost World War II, a lot of things happened mm -hmm. to Germany. Mm -hmm. When Japan lost the war, a lot of things happened to Japan. Yeah. The United States lost the war, nothing. I mean, there was a lot of dead Americans that died over there, but nothing happened to the United States. In fact, President Ford, because I saved the newspaper from that day, April 30th, 1975, mm -hmm. and President Ford said at the time, let's put this behind us. Let's look to the future. Mm -hmm. But the paper is interesting because we're talking behind us was 12 hours ago. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about some long, we're saying, well, let's forget about you know, the Vietnam mm -hmm. War, okay. and let's think, just think so about it. So you mean when, when we're fighting far away, when the American, the people do not want to pay those war taxes when the American soldiers do not want to fight that far, when the local people are resistance and they do not want to be colonized. So I, I see a pattern. Why Vietnam and anti-war movement are still important today? Well, 
Well, it's, it's important to learn from history. And it's important not to be lied about history. And that's, mm -hmm. we started off talking about the 50th anniversary of the mm -hmm. American government, the Pentagon mm -hmm. and the American government lying to the American public mm -hmm. about what happened during Vietnam. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you go to their website, the commemoration, 50th anniversary commemoration, mm -hmm. if you type in their internal search engine, mm -hmm. anti-war protests, nothing comes up. But I yeah. thought that was a huge history of it. Well, it is, but that's it's so whitewashed. Is that Orwellian way of it's Orwellian. wiping off? It's called the memory hole. It's, 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 uh, it gets hole. burned. It's, it's, oh. it's, uh, there's nothing about the anti-war movement. There's nothing about Kent State. There's nothing about protest. In fact, when you look up the Gulf of Tonkin in 1964, mm -hmm. it has the same lie that we're given in 1964, that we were attacked, the United States government was attacked. And everybody knows, we're, this is now 2015, everybody who said the issue points out the American government was not attacked mm -hmm. on the Gulf of Tonkin. But mm -hmm. it's the same lie that's on the website mm -hmm. right now. So it's important to have the young people not be lied to. And it's important for the American people in general not to be, not to be lied to. But what's going on? I think one of the things, you know, when, when Saigon fell, was liber, fell or was liberated, I, I pretty much put the anti-war uh, movement behind me. Uh, it was over. I didn't really think I was starting a job, family, so didn't. I had other things to do, and then, but it, the the uh, imperative for war didn't stop. The United States continued to uh, ex exert military uh, power throughout the world and other countries all the way up to the present. So that's why, that's why it's important, because they're using the same kinds of deception. And they make it seem that, well, it's patriotic. I mean, that Bush took 9-11 and just rode it all the way into Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, what 9-11 what had to do with Afghanistan? Somebody in the cave, you know, the kind of, I, I, I would just wonder, but what was your understanding at that time about Gulf of, Gulf of Tonkin? Gulf, well, that was back in my right wing days, so I said, "Yeah, let's go get them." Mm -hmm. uh, looking no, but, at what, 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 what happened? But I mean, later on, we were, you, I mean, when I come to understand the yeah. real facts, what were the facts? Uh, the facts were that we were not attacked, mm -hmm. and plus, we had been the two ships that were supposedly attacked—the Sea Turner Joy and I think the Maddox—were they were up in North Vietnamese waters. We had been running intelligence missions in North Vietnamese waters. Now think about it, if somebody were doing that in American waters, we would not attack. Oh. I mean, so the, if the Russian sh ships were, you know, saying hello to Port of Olympia or somewhere else, I mean, uh, is that the analogy you're trying to make? Yeah, if there weren't a peace, you know, if there weren't Chinese, a, if, 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 warships. Yeah, if it was a warship in, in time of war, uh -huh. that in your, your territorial waters, are you not going to be suspicious? Mm -hmm. Especially this country that's uh, been in engaged in your country for, at that point, what, 10 years. Mm -hmm. So what is this amnesia? What is this amnesia you talk about? You know, what is that amnesia will do to the uh, future wars or future interventions or future sugar-coated things, they will call it? I think it will uh, allow them to continue. And that, people need to start thinking about what are they telling us? And it's clear enough we can look at Vietnam and see that, and we can also look at the more recent wars. I mean, Everybody except Dick Cheney accepts the fact that you know, we were lied to. Mm -hmm. Dick Cheney says, nope, it's, <laughs> and he's still doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the legacy of war? Well, the legacy of war in general, the legacy of the Vietnam War, one of the legacies of the Vietnam War is that the American people did not want to fight another war after, like talk about the Vietnam Syndrome. And that word's interesting, that's what the American government called it. Syndrome is a uh, symptom of disease. So the American government was saying in 1975 that the American people were sick. Because they we had a disease because they had a noble cause they didn't want it to. No, because we did not want to have peace of sickness for the American government in 1975. Uh. What's interesting about that, there's a very good book by, uh, called In Search of Enemies. I'm trying to think of the author right now who's actually a CIA agent involved with Africa. It'll come, it'll come to me. But he pointed out that the American government wanted to fight in South Africa on the white South African side. Because remember, that's when the, the anti-apartheid movement was really becoming more militant. Uh. Mandela and people like that. Mm -hmm. And the American government wanted to fight in, uh, in South Africa, with the whites in South Africa. But the American government uh, knew that the American people were sick of war. So we didn't actually sort of be, weren't able to actually uh, go to war. And also the American government was very concerned because about approximately at that time, about a third of the army was African American. And so can you trust an African American army to actually fight with the uh, whites in South Africa? Most American How soldiers- How draft? Yeah. Most American soldiers will do what they're told, but what's the percentage of people who might not? 
-hmm. And Einstein said if you get 2% of the population, 2% of the military refusing to participate, then they can't fight the war. Now, what's interesting about that with Vietnam is that in fiscal year 1971, 14% of mm -hmm. the American military deserted. Mm -hmm. Talking about desertions. 14% mm -hmm. of 14. the American... 14.8%, something around. Yeah. I have heard, saw yeah. some figures, and I said, wow, yeah. really? Yeah, 500,000 so 500, people deserted during the entire time yeah. of the war. Yeah. And so that's where you talk about the American military being busted, because it was not a war of... Um, it was not a war defending the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's not because the soldiers were cowardly. Mm -hmm. It's because they're actually starting to think about what's going on. Mm -hmm. In World War II, like you said, you wanted to come, come back. In World War II, you were in for the w duration of the war. If you got drafted or if you joined, the duration of the war. You didn't get a chance to do one year and you come back. In, war, in the Vietnam War, you wanted to do it for, you only got one year, mm -hmm. unless you wanted to sort of re-up for another year or mm -hmm. got recalled for another year. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a war of necessity, which is a, one of the terms we've heard before, like necessity. World War II. Yeah, in World War II. A paradigm of death and destruction is necessity? Yeah, well, if you believe in war, <laughs> which I don't, but if you believe in war, there are wars of necessity and wars of choice. And so wars of necessity is that the United States was attacked in World War II, and therefore we were going to be overrun in World War II, or at least that's the perception. Mm -hmm. And so we need to defend ourselves. In the Vietnam War, it was a war of choice. We never had to fight the war. When we did lose the war, it really didn't make any difference mm -hmm. to the, to the mm -hmm. physical territory mm -hmm. of the United States. Mm -hmm. It made a lot of difference to people's lives here, 58,000 mm -hmm. dead Americans. Mm -hmm. and and but approximately three million Americans served in, in the theater of operation, mm -hmm. but also two million dead Vietnamese, mm -hmm. and about two million other Laotians and Cambodians uh, died. So suffering and heartache, and destruction of the environment of people of lives, mm -hmm. and all that. So how could that be a necessity? Well, it wasn't, mm -hmm. especially in Vietnam. It was not. So it's an Orwellian uh, playing a game. Yeah, yeah, it's Orwellian term. And it was presented as, well, if we don't fight them, if we don't fight them in Vietnam, we'll have to fight them here, yeah, which is Golden exactly Gate what Bridge. we're hearing now. Yeah, well, that, that was Lyndon Johnson's words. We have what? to fight them at the Golden Gate Bridge. If this, somehow this Vietnamese army and navy was going to come to the United States the Golden and Gate Bridge, yes, the a small itty bitty little country. Yeah. And they, don't even, they, first, they didn't even have a navy, <laughs> <laughs> but the idea that they're going to come here and take us over was this um, horrible illusion. So, could America still paying for the cost of of veterans and uh, the Agent Orange? Uh, we know of veterans who have died, mm -hmm. Vietnam veterans who have died due to complications later on of you know Vietnam. Uh, of Agent Orange and stuff, isn't that a legacy of war? Oh, definitely. I mean, the yeah. war has a lot, even when a war finally ends, if it does, mm -hmm. it has a long tail. Uh, you're paying cost of veterans care of the wounded. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I can, and one example is the highest cost of medical care for World War II veterans was 1995. Mm -hmm. so, so late, so long right. after. Right, and Vietnam, because, okay. you know, you're we're still paying because for the liability. It's, it's a, yeah. If you're looking at a commercial business or anything else, it's, it's a liability. Yeah. So how come we have the biggest welfare system for the war profiteers, right. and and then we have you know the people who are held, the real people, the 99 percent, you know, uh, or any other metaphor we use, uh, are held to pay war taxes essentially. The war taxes plus the top one percent does very little of the fighting. Mm -hmm. In fact, I remember uh, watching a documentary about the war, and Representative Long of Maryland mm -hmm. was actually uh, having a hearing, and he pointed out that his son mm -hmm. was the only son mm -hmm. of a congressman that actually fought in Vietnam and was wounded. Is that mm -hmm. if you think about it, uh, what are the mathematical odds over a 20 year war that these men who are in Congress who are between 40 and 60 that their sons would not be involved in the war? There, there were people who, who went to war, like Al Gore and people like that, but they were taking pictures. Uh -huh. They were in the back. Uh -huh. They weren't actually the grunts in the, in the, yeah. in the, in the front. And so these, it's not the rich people who mm -hmm. actually fight the war. And that's one of the reasons that the poor people were against the war. They're doing the fighting mm -hmm. and for no real purpose. For the same reason African Americans were against the war, because they were doing a disproportionate share of the fighting. Right. What happened to um, uh, Mr. Bond? Uh, what was uh, Muhammad Ali? What happened? I mean, because he did not want it to go and fight. Um, other poor or disenfranchised people. Is that correct? Something was mentioned, something along the lines? Yeah. 
Hmm? And this is Mr. Said it again? Muhammad Ali. Ma okay. The, yes. He was a heavyweight champion, and he was a title was taken from him. Yeah, and he said no Viet Cong ever called me the N word. Oh. Yeah. He had no he had no quarrel with him. Yeah. In fact, and it wasn't because he was afraid of going to war because he was not going to be put on the front line. He would have been like an Elvis Presley type of routine because oh. Elvis Presley went to the army and he sang and danced for the army. And Muhammad Ali would have been if he was in the army would have been exhibitions for yeah. the army. So he decided he was not going to go. He was not going to go into the military service and actually sort of be a front man for the Ameri for the American government. And so it, it cost him quite a bit. It cost him uh, the title for a period of time, mm -hmm. at least $3 million, that's the mm -hmm. estimates are that he would have uh, won during, the, mm -hmm. during that time. So he was actually acting as a matter of principle, not as an act of matter of So he of paid power. a huge, Muhammad Ali, the heavyweight champion, he paid a huge cost right. for standing up and doing the noble thing, yeah. a, a great thing. A, a wonderful thing, the intrinsic, mm -hmm. you know, human spirit. Could it be said that Vietnam still re reaps the sorrowful legacy of Agent Orin oh. and exploded ordinances? Oh, yeah. Even to this day? I mean, uh, people are being killed to this day with the uh, unexploded ordinance. Mm -hmm. uh, Veterans for Peace actually has a uh, group over there now that's working on removing that. But there is so much. I mean, we dropped so much ordinance on Vietnam and Laos. I mean, the countries are both they're littered with these mm -hmm. explosives. So that legacy is there. It's going to be there for some time. One of the things that we did not do, you know, we signed the peace treaty with uh, Vietnam in 19, 1973. We promised $3.5 billion in our reconstruction aid. Mm -hmm. Never sent a penny of it. Wow. So we broke that treaty right off. And then we spent 20 years isolating Vietnam in the, in the world. And we understand, our audience understand, that treaty is above any U.S. law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, treaties are part of the Constitution that says that Treaties become the law of the land, mm -hmm. like the Constitution. Mm -hmm. That's what the Constitution actually says. Mm -hmm. um, some people may not like the fact that treaties are part of the law, the supreme law of the land, but that's mm -hmm. what the Constitution says. And so um, the American government basically um, lied in its treaty, and if you want some references for that, ask any Native American. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, does people have power to stop the war? I think they do, because that's actually one of the things that uh, the anti-war movement among the GIs was the most important part of the war, the anti-war movement. And it wasn't until later that the college students actually got involved as a, a process. But the American government could not fight the war the way it wanted to fight the war. So the American government then started to pull out. Nixon talked about a Vietnamization, mm -hmm. which actually was a fraud too, because if you think about it, if the war was important, mm -hmm. then like World War II, mm -hmm. then we should fight the war. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you can actually have an option not to fight the war, the very fact that you have that option means that it's not necessary. So the American people, after 1968 especially, started to really come out against uh, the war. And the, and the protests actually did make a huge difference, because sometimes people think protests don't, doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a couple, one specific example. In 19, uh, Richard Nixon's book, his autobiography, are in Halderman's book, The Price of Power, mm -hmm. his chief of staff, and also the book by Seymour Hirsch on, the, uh, on Kissinger mm -hmm. talk about this incident. The, the moratoriums in 1969, October 15th, 1969, and November 15th, 1969, there were huge, massive protests, hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of people. Now, Nixon had told the Vietnamese through Kissinger mm -hmm. in negotiations that he was going to use an atom bomb on North Vietnam on November 1st, 1969. And, of course, he did not do that because otherwise we would have heard about it. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason he did not do that, because if you make a threat, you better follow up on it, because mm -hmm. the next time you make a threat, they won't, they mm -hmm. won't uh, believe you. It's because the, the protest that happened on October 15, 1969, this is what Nixon says himself, is that he was afraid that if he had dropped an atom bomb on North Vietnam, they were going to be near the Chinese border. Atomic, Atomic bomb, bomb. Mm -hmm. on North Vietnam? Yeah, that's what he said he was going to do. Nixon, call, Nixon called it the madman theory, because it sounds so crazy. He even described himself as a madman that he knew that the next protest was November 15th. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't just afraid of losing in Vietnam. He was afraid of losing here. Mm -hmm. That if, the, instead of having 500,000 people on the streets, there might have been 5 million people mm -hmm. on the streets. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't control the mm -hmm. American population. So the American population actually stopped the American government from using that bomb. Mm -hmm. So it does make a huge difference. It and, does make a difference. And to follow up on that, the GI resistance had a big effect because they could not continue to fight the war with an army that wasn't willing to fight. You know, a lot of us would just go through the motions and just, that was it. 
And of course, they came up with a countermeasure, which was the all-volunteer army, which is, you know, in Vietnam, the army was part of the populace because that's, that's where the dra people were drafted from. But afterwards, they've been set, set a full-time professional army, and as we've seen in the most recent wars, it's a very small portion of society. So the impact of the war doesn't come out to the general populace. You see it in the soldiers and their families and the communities, but more speaking, most people don't even know a soldier. Whereas back in Vietnam, everybody, if they didn't know a soldier, you knew somebody who did, or you knew a family down the street. We, we have the smallest percentage uh, of people who are actually serving. Yeah, so, I mean, it was good that we resisted in the military, but on the other hand, they came up with a, a workaround that has persisted to this day that allows them to continue, continue wars. Mm -hmm. So we have to, as, as an anti-war movement, we need to be thinking, how do we work, you know, how do we respond to that? Mm -hmm. And what kind of information can we bring uh, to bear? Because if we, if we don't, and people forget this, these wars are gonna go on forever. I mean, that's, that's why we, we got into Afghanistan so easily because it was a war of necessity. They attacked us. Well, somebody somewhere there attacked us, and that was enough. In Iraq, well, they were a threat to the world. Mushroom clouds over New York, I think. Mm -hmm. So that was a war of necessity, kind of, sort of. So they used that. So we need to be thinking about how it is you know, we as, as anti-war uh, individuals can organize. And the best, best way to organize is with information. So mm -hmm. it's what this, uh, Teaching is aimed at doing, and the whole program is to say, yes, you'll hear a lot about Vietnam from the Pentagon, and you'll see that site, but there's another side of the story, and we want you to hear that. What is the web other website? It's called, you said, VietnamFullDisclosure.org? Yes. Is, is I believe, or if you go VietnamFullDisclosure.org. I think that's what it is, and it's all, if you go to VeteransForPeace.org, there's a link to it there mm -hmm. uh, that would get you in. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's a ton of information, articles, um, ideas. One of the things we would very much like to do is reach out to some uh, secondary school and social studies teachers mm -hmm. to offer them some ideas about how to teach the war. Because right now, they don't really teach it other than to say it was a time of turmoil, which is time true, of turmoil. but that yeah. masks a lot. Oh. Yeah. I often so ask what, myself, yeah. what is a teaching? Uh, you've been a teaching for 40 years. Yeah. What is a teaching? But what would that achieve? What would you talk about in a teaching? Well, this particular teaching will try to talk about the lies the American government is per currently putting out about the Vietnam War when they lied about the war then. And then try to get people to uh, use their own intelligence, use their own uh, crit critical thinking to see what they want to do. We're not going to tell people what they have to do. We're going to tell people that they should make up their own mind but also to try to figure out uh, what it means, not just about 50 years ago, but what it means for us, what it means for us today. So teaching, do you have to be enrolled in a school no, or no, no. college? No, 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 okay. it'll be open to everybody. In fact, okay. one of the things we're gonna do is October 28th is the day, day we October pick. October 28th, yeah, which is when, Yeah, around noon at Round the Evergreen, noon. It's Evergreen State College. We haven't got the exact room yet, but we'll get that, oh. then get that information out. But the two, two. Um, so anybody can come in. Anybody and, can come. And it will be like an hour or two hours. Well, about or something. two hours. Two, two hours. hours. Okay. But the week before that, we'll have a couple of movies to give some people some background. Where Our, would the movies be? Uh, the movies will be in the uh, seminar two building. Also, we'll okay. get the exact mm. rooms. But the movies are Hearts and Minds, which is a mm. incredible documentary about the Vietnam War, two mm -hmm. hours long, mm -hmm. and a movie called Sir No Sir about the um, you know resistance of the GIs. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't just, the, it wasn't the college students that were actually the forefront, it was mm -hmm. the GIs themselves. And that's an important point because it's, we're not talking about something which is unpatriotic. Mm -hmm. My definition of patriotism is a sense of community. Mm -hmm. If we have a sense of community, then we're patriotic. Mm -hmm. If we want to believe the American government when it lies to you, that's mm -hmm. not patriotism. That's just uh, being rather foolish about mm -hmm. what the American government is telling you. So don't believe the American government, don't believe any government when it's actually telling you something if they're, they're not speaking in your particular mm -hmm. uh, in, instance. So people should make up their own, people mm -hmm. should make up their own minds. Mm -hmm. That's your question. Mm -hmm. yeah. You say we need, it's a war of necessity, you say, why? What's yeah. the necessity? So, so you meant your necessity to ask, I mean, what is in it for we the people? We the real people, not we the selected few war profiteers. So necessity, why it is necessary? Theoretically, it's something that it's a, like existential threat to this country. Uh, existential, yeah. huge country. Yeah. With, okay. Yeah. It's, it's Actually, kinda, how could that people? We're like the elephants, uh, scared of the mouse. Yeah. 
Alpha to scare of the mouse. Yeah. There's that image. I don't know if it's okay. true. Yeah, 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 I remember I, reading an article one time. The War of 1812 okay. was actually more important than the Vietnam War. Because when the United States lost the Vietnam War, nothing happened to the United States, the physical territory or the mm -hmm. structure of the United States. Mm -hmm. If the United States had lost the War of 1812, we would have gone back to the British. Mm -hmm. So the War of 1812 was actually much more important. And most mm -hmm. people don't understand what the War of yeah, 1812 sure. was about. So and also... The, that's a good way to put that in perspective. Yeah, because sort of what is yeah. existential and what's actually mm -hmm. a war of choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and a choice is existential actually... Existential to me is that we won't be around. Right. Somebody yeah. will come and bomb us in our this beautiful place in this little great place in, we live in Washington. Yeah, and that's not going to happen. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> that's not so, going to happen. So that's not existential. But it's presented me, as... That's exa yeah. existential. It's presented as if it is that level of threat, that okay. we must do this. Mm -hmm. So it's hyping up, mm -hmm. exaggerating way out of blown threat, perhaps. Yes, and it works especially when people are afraid. And think about 9-11. Everybody was afraid. It was shocking. So isn't so. that what they call it, the shock and awe doctrine? You know, so that was yeah. that, that was to attack uh, Iraq. Right. <laughs> okay. and, but in fact, that's what <laughs> happened. What they happened did, to we did to, to, everybody was shocked and yeah. mm -hmm. quite amazed. Like what? So you talked about veteransforpeace.org earlier uh, in the coffee break. You were talking about veterans for peace, chapter one hundred nine. So what is their website? Our website is. I should know this, shouldn't I? Is it, is it, could it be VFP109RCC.org? It is, yes. So please check out VFP109RCC.org, Veterans for Peace, Chapter 109, Rachel Corey Chapter. So RCC stands for Rachel Corey Chapter. And please check that out. The other thing was VietnamFullDisclosure.org. The other website was... Uh, VietnamFullDisclosure.org, that o Olympia Movement for Justice, Justice and Peace. Peace has a website. Yeah, o what is that website? It's OMG, OMJP.org. So OMJP.org. So Olympia Movement for Peace and Justice. Justice and if they Peace. would like to, f uh, uh, yeah, if they would like to, people would like to find out more about the movies. I mean, I, are they yeah. free? Do people have to pay yeah. a fee? No, everything will be free to uh, students and to the public. Okay. The movies are free. And actually, if you can't make the movies, because uh, mm -hmm. I was on the college campus, huh? I think they're available on YouTube. Hearts and Minds is the name of the movie. And mm -hmm. the other movie is Sir, No, Sir. Mm -hmm. And they're really, uh, I think, uh, great movies. They're yeah. available on YouTube. Yeah, they're very So you YouTube. don't have to have a subscription like no, Netflix right. or something. You no. can, people can watch that people there. People can watch it. So we also plan to film much of this. So okay. some of the proceedings will be on one of our future shows. Wonderful. So people can go to the Olympia M Moment Movement. for Justice and Peace, OMJP, and you will have the dates and times where people can do that. And it's a teaching. Teaching doesn't mean you have to be a student, but you know, if, if you are uh, Sufi or mystic, you understand that the education uh, goes from cradle to grave. And uh, in, in the meantime, we'll make great communities and uh, inspire each other and empower each other. Right. So any last parting thoughts to wrap up? Well, I was thinking that, yes, what is a teaching? It's, it's where people get inf exchange information, get information, and learn how to think. Well, for, from each other, not, yeah. not, not propaganda from it's multinational not, it's not handed corporations? Down. Okay, it's not from top to bottom. Well, one last thing, because I think you were mentioning about how people do not want to be colonized. Uh -huh. um, we understand that viscerally in American society. Mm -hmm. That's why we had an American revolution against the colonizers yeah, in Great the, Britain. Yeah, the British at that time who and burned down the White House. Right. Our, you know, twice. And we American were, White House and twice. And the same thing with the Vietnamese did not want to be colonized by the United States. And the, and the oh. people of the world did not want to be colonized by the United States. And the American people are not benefiting. It's the top 1%. It's a class-based society, mm -hmm. so it's the top 1% approximately who are the people who are benefiting from the wars, even though they don't fight the wars. It's mm -hmm. the working people that fight the wars. So it's, it's, it's very wonderful how you say it. It's like meeting at the level, being at equal, mm -hmm. you know, and, and having a mutual respect and dignity for each other. Yeah. So that was our uh, program for tonight, a, a, a wonderful uh, sharing of experiences, uh, really, from a Vietnam veteran and from a teacher, uh, uh, intellectual, and a researcher. So hopefully, we, you know, it's a food for thought, and hopefully we can, we can really absorb it. And for that great fu future of peace, we can all manifest, imagine, and create here and now.
Thank you very much. I'm your host, Zahid Chowdhury, Mark Fleming, and Larry Mosqueda were our guests tonight. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening. To their future.